Good evening to all you brave people who came out in this weather, but you know it's worth it because tonight I know it's going to be a great program. My name is Gwen Borowski. I'm the CEO of the museum. I'm also a trustee of FPRI. Eli said to say how it's the greatest organization in the world, and it is. I really believe that, along with the museum. So uh, we have a wonderful partnership here, and actually our mission here is very much related and um, to the work of FPRI, although it's quite different. And we've had a wonderful relationship and synergy holding these lectures here for now many years, I've lost count. Um, we talk about issues of liberty, very contemporary issues of liberty, through stories of people who have done something to champion the cause of liberty. And our work is really on the cusp of working with civics and character education. That's reflected in our exhibits. We have a year-long program in um, a number of 20 of Philadelphia's most under-resourced schools where we provide actually the civics and social studies curriculum there with our own educators. And um, certainly the work that FPRI does, while one is very scholarly, we're very hands-on, one is, I mean, there's wonderful education programs at FPRI. We really work a lot with kids and kind of retail with people coming into the museum. Both of us, I think, are organizations that care very deeply about what is going on in the world and are doing our best to provide some solutions in a small way in any place we can. So um, I welcome you all here. I would love to show you our new ex exhibit downstairs. It's around that big glass flame that you saw. If anyone's interested after the lecture, just let me know, I'll get it turned on. And I know we're in for a big treat tonight to, well, treat, maybe, if that's the right word. <laughs> A very interesting discussion tonight about a portion of the world I'm sure we all care very much about. So on that note, welcome, and I turn the program over. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before I get started, I would like to take a moment and request that everyone uh, mute or turn off your cell phones or other devices. Uh, and then we'll get started. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is Tuesday night in Philadelphia, and the world is as complicated as ever. So, let's talk about it. Welcome to the February 2019 edition of Geopolitics with Granary, FPRI's monthly discussion of international affairs. I'm Ron Granary, Executive Director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West, your host and moderator of tonight's discussion. All of us at FPRI, Thank you for joining us tonight on the internet and live this evening on February 12th, 2019 at the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Tonight, our topic is the Middle East, the overpromised land, where land is holy, but the borders and politics most assuredly are not. The region has occupied the attention and determined the political fates of a long parade of presidents and prime ministers often to the sorrow of many more nameless innocents, and offers a variety of Gordian knots at which countless would-be Alexanders have tried to take a whack. Those problems may have their roots in ancient texts, but they also reflect some of the central questions of modern geopolitics, from the connection between nationalism, religion, and ethnic identity, to the challenges of building legitimate representative governments, from access to raw materials, to human rights, to the shifting sands of alliances. The players have changed over the years, but the peoples have not. We still have Persians and Turks and Arabs and Jews, aided and abetted by a motley collection of Americans, Russians, various Europeans, and even the Chinese, all seeking their advantage, looking to the past to justify the claims of the present as they aim for a more stable and secure future. Often the best way to engage familiar tenacious issues is to discuss them with a new arrival. And tonight, Geopolitics with Granary offers just that, as we welcome the new director of FPRI's Middle East program for a conversation about today's turmoil in the Middle East and probably 
tomorrows as well. So how is the current turmoil in the Middle East different from other turmoil over the past centuries? Have some problems become easier to solve or harder? Considering its own history, what, if any, role should the United States play in the region going forward? These questions and yours will guide us in conversation with our guest, Dr. Aaron Stein. Dr. Aaron Stein, sitting right here, is the director of FPRI's program on the Middle East. After earning a BA in politics from the University of San Francisco and an MA in international policy studies with a specialization in non-proliferation from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, Dr. Stein received his PhD in Middle East and Mediterranean Studies at King's College London. He has been a doctoral fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, an associate fellow of the Royal United Services Institute, and non-proliferation program manager at the Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies in Istanbul. He has published in Survival, Rusi Journal, Foreign Affairs, War on the Rocks, and The American Interest. A former resident senior fellow of the Atlantic Council, where he managed their Turkey-related research program, oversaw work on nonproliferation in the Middle East with a focus on Iran, and researched non-state actors in the region with a particular focus on Kurdish groups in Syria and Iraq, and also sold popcorn and whatever else was expected of him. <laughs> Dr. Stein also hosts the Arms Control Wonk and Turkey Wonk podcasts. A brilliant young scholar on the Middle East and one of the newest members of the FPRI family, we are delighted to have him with us tonight. Welcome, Aaron Stein. Well, thank you very That's quite the intro. Thank well, you very you much know, for that. We want, to, we want to start you off comfortable. That's right. right. <laughs> Shorten it up next time. So so, we have more time to talk. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to FPRI. Yeah. And uh, uh, before we get started with the specifics, I'm curious, what would you like our members and partners and friends to know about you and your plans as director of our Middle East program? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Unexpected. Uh, first of all, thank everybody for coming. Uh, my colleague, Chris Miller, who runs the Eurasia program, is in Miami. So he has the better of the two speaking events in terms of weather. Um, in terms of weather, maybe not in terms of weather, of, uh, okay. but not in terms of attendees. <laughs> uh, in terms of how I would like to take the program is, you know, I, I inherited a great program. Mm -hmm. uh, my predecessor, Tally, uh, right. basically stood the program up uh, and just concluded as I was coming on with this large project after the caliphate. Uh, that looked at the enduring challenges posed by the Islamic State. And I think that is a good place to pick up uh, a sort of post-Tally Aaron tenure uh, in post-2019 in, in and beyond about what the region looks like mm -hmm. uh, after conflict, perhaps after the U.S. withdrawal, uh, on a country-by-country -country basis uh, with a focus on conflict uh, and uh, maybe pivoting to uh, larger issues of geostrategic competition. Mm -hmm. Great. So for a long time, uh, I won't say how long, it depends on who you ask, I guess, but uh, discussions of the Middle East have revolved almost exclusively around discussions of the Arab-Israeli conflict. True. One certainly can't say that today. So is that progress? I think, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's stasis. I mean, uh -huh. if you look at these sort of dividing issues and that enduring conflict, uh, nothing has really been resolved. They've just sort of been pushed aside and perhaps pushed under the rug. Uh, why larger issues within the region have subsumed their governments uh, and our own. And you know, perhaps you could view that as progress, is that there's less outward hostility and hatred every single day. They're just being redirected. But perhaps that hatred and hostility is just being re redirected to other places that have other impacts on U.S. foreign policy goals. So speaking of U.S. foreign policy goals, how would you define current American policy in the Middle East? I'm not sure we have one, uh, <laughs> to be honest, but that's Which, my job. That obviates my question of whether it's working. Then, right? uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's actually a really good question. I mean, particularly as we get to what I call the sillier season, mm -hmm. which is as we begin to ramp up into the, 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 the campaign for for the, for the 2020 uh, election, that, that's going to be an outstanding question, is, is what is the United States' role in the Middle East and what should, how should we define those interests mm -hmm. in, in line with policy outcomes that we would like? Uh, and in line with what I do see as an emerging political consensus, that even though we have this fractured, polarized debate within the United States, 
amongst left and right in this country. Uh, there seems to be a consensus that the United States should do less in the Middle East, yeah. and particularly less militarily. And so how do you do that in a way that, is, that you try and maximize US interests around these sort of systemic and enduring conflicts? You look at Iraq, you can look at Syria, you can look at Arab Israel, I mean, sorry, uh, Arab pa Israel Palestine, excuse me, uh, and what the American role should be keeping in mind that one constant is that the Americans should play a lesser role. Lesser role. I mean, that's what I think is, you know, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration were essentially elected promising to reduce that American role. Yes. I mean, if you look at the, the, the galvanizing issue for the election of President Obama, it was end stupid wars. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case, it was the drawdown and withdrawal from Iraq in 2011, focus on the good war in Afghanistan. Uh, where with the introduction of President Trump, it's focus on no wars. Let's end the, the, the good war in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's begin the drawdown of US forces uh, uh, in Syria. Because where I think the two men differ, and they have a lot of differences, um, I think that's the understatement of the year. Um, but what President Trump has said quite frequently about the American role in the Middle East in particular, but it applies to his broader vision for US power more globally, is that other countries, both allies and adversaries, free ride on the back of American power. And if you particularly ascribe it to the Middle East, the oversized American military role, as he describes it, uh, is actually an enabler of hostile actors in the case of the Iranians and the Russians. Well, let's talk about the Iranians for a second, right? You know, they're, they are marking the 40th anniversary of their revolution, the creation of the Islamic Republic. Uh, what, what is the nature of Iran's role in the Middle East, and what about, you know, the, the, the Trump administration certainly has made no secret of its hostility to the Iranian regime. And so how can American foreign policy both seek to reduce the American military presence in the region and respond to what we are told is the Iranian military challenge in the region? I mean, that's another good question and a very difficult question to answer. I mean, the Trump administration has come in with this policy that they've dubbed maximum pressure. And what the maximum pressure campaign is meant to do is being an overarching umbrella for guiding of, of US strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And so it's, we're no longer going to be sympathetic to sort of the Iranian presence within the region, perhaps as the Obama administration was, uh, we were going to look at every single avenue to counter their, their, their actions. So whether that's in Yemen, it's basically full carte blanche support for the, uh, the Saudi-led coalition with the Emiratis. Uh, Syria is a bit more muddled, and we can talk about that. Uh, in Iraq, it's more or less a continuation of American foreign policy dating back to the Bush administration, which is the best way to counter the Iranians in Iraq is to, en to enhance a stable central Iraqi government with a functioning military. Mm -hmm. The question is still out about whether that is working. Uh, and then the, as it applies specifically to the Iranians themselves, it's to remove the, the US from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, mm -hmm. and to use sanctions, reimposition of sanctions, uh, and then particularly the threat of secondary sanction uh, to deter foreign companies uh, and foreign countries from doing business with them. Is it working? Well, um, I'm not sure. Uh, what, what would a definition of working be? Well, in that you know, case? if you were to take just the sort of straight language out of the Trump administration, it would be regime, or there would be change in regime behavior. Okay. Just, by which that is a metric, bunch of extra words around yes. the words regime and change. Yeah, I'm going to say what, what I really think the <laughs> idea is. Um, uh, 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 but by that metric, there is, I mean, you could set out your methodology and test on your dependent and independent variables if you'd like, but I would say the answer <laughs> is no. Um, but if you were to look at the, what I think the actual policy is, it's regime change. Mm -hmm. And it's to use the heavy pressure economically to foment internal unrest in Iran, particularly around economic issues, to force a bottom-up change. And by that metric, too, the policy is failing. Is failing. And the JCPOA, at the time that it was negotiated, the argument was the United States was fa um, had managed to pull together a pretty substantial international coalition 
to pressure the Iranians to sign that agreement. Mm -hmm. And one of the arguments that the Obama administration made about the JCPOA was it may be imperfect, but it's our, it, it, this is the moment to do it because that coalition or that, that particular constellation of, of sanctioners wouldn't hold. So now we get the JCPOA. The Trump administration says we're pulling out because it's imperfect. Um, is there any chance of a return to that level of international cooperation to sanction Iran? Well, so the JCPOA was necessary at the time that it was negotiated largely for factors that were outside of control of the United States. Mm -hmm. First was that the Iranians had moved to a place to where, do you remember the BB bomb graph? Does everybody remember that picture he took to the United yeah. Nations? where they would, they, and the Israelis said that they would soon pass into the zone of immunity. <clears throat> you know, what they meant is that they would have enough uh, low enriched uranium to where it would be stockpiled to where if they wanted to continue to enrich it, they could do so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, they would enter that zone of immunity that the Israelis called it. And so it, there became a technical reason to try and reach an agreement uh, possible. Mm -hmm. Because there was a political will amongst the United States to reach an agreement, mm -hmm. Uh, you had uh, the Europeans in particular join the sanctions regime. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I think it was in 2012, where the European Union managed to pass sanctions that were more or less exactly the same as those of the United States. Uh, and then, importantly, they traded those sanctions when the Iranians were willing to take yes for an answer and make concessions on their part. Now, as we begin to reinstitute the sanctions regime to try and pressure them, Yes, the United States has the economic power to dissuade the Europeans from doing business in Iran. If you were a private European country or a European bank, the U.S. financial system is far more valuable than Iran, of course. Uh, so you make an easy choice there, but that doesn't mean you like it. Mm -hmm. And that is where you, where you may have short-term economic success, sorry, political success in deterring economic activity, but you have longer term political problems because the Europeans believe that the Iranian uh, proliferation problem uh, was solved with the JCPOA and the P5 plus one, you know, the, 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 the negotiating um, 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 apparatus for the JCPOA, which is you know, essentially the, the UN Security Council members plus Germany. Mm -hmm. It's only the United States that, had with, that has deviated from its position in terms of how to deal with the Iranian proliferation threat. I, uh, the, the question of nuclear proliferation alone and nuclear power can keep us very busy. I think about the, you go from the zone of immunity to the zone of the President of the United States saying good things about you on Twitter if you have nuclear weapons. Well, that's right. the problem. Like, so that's one of the disincentives is that the Iranians, you know, whatever you think of the JCPOA, and if you really want to get into it, you know, I, 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 I'm such a nerd, I got up early to read the text when the Russians leaked it. Uh, and so <laughs> it's 159 pages, and I really liked it. It's a good, it's a good agreement. You know, the, the U.S. did a good job. Um, it's a shame what happened, but um, uh, 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 you know, they're, they're, I mean, I could talk about the JCPOA all day, but uh, you know, the, the the political conditions were there for agreement. The Iranians did everything, sort of. They negotiated hard in their own interests. They got something. They gave a lot of stuff up. Uh, but they ultimately never were successful in developing nuclear weapon, whereas the country that did, uh, North Korea, gets two high-profile summits. It's a, an interesting question, right? When, when, you ask, when, when people ask the question, why do states want to get nuclear weapons? This is my dissertation this topic. There you yeah. go. Well, good. Well, we, we look forward to We'll have you back to talk about that when that comes out, too. Uh, when, uh, but I want to get to this, this issue of Iran as a, as a regional actor and its impact on the politics of the region, both, you know, the... American policy towards Saudi Arabia, for example, is shaped in part by attitudes towards Iran and Saudi attitudes towards Iran. Um, and how should we, sitting here in Philadelphia, try to understand the dynamic that is at play right now in the region between Saudi Arabia and Iran? I mean, it's poisonous, but if you want to take a look at sort of the, the, the Iranian motivations mm -hmm. for what they're doing, because the Iranians use third state proxies or non-state proxies as sort of force multipliers to, to, to advance their own self-defined interests. Mm -hmm. And I think within the context of the, of the US, Saudi, Iranian, I guess, triangle, 
you can look at Iraq, for example, as a good mm -hmm. uh, uh, way to think about the way the Iranians do business, is that you know, as the U.S. began to prepare to topple uh, Saddam Hussein in 2003, despite, and then the Iranians had hosted much of the exiled political elites that ultimately moved back into the country and are now empowered, uh, despite those close ties with the Iraqi political elites that were in Iran uh, taking uh, uh, under asylum procedures, they still did not support the U.S. toppling of Saddam Hussein because it's more the devil you know than the devil you don't know. And so even, and then as those Iraqi politicians came back, uh, the Iranian presence actually became something that many of them have resisted, because as a, it's a, used against them politically as their tools of a foreign country, even mm -hmm. if it's one as close as Iran. And even though there are cross sectarian linkages between Arab Shia and uh, uh, Persian Shia. Uh, and so they began to use non-state actors from these diaspora communities to undermine the American-supported government. Mm. And you can look at sort of what they're doing in Syria in much the same way. I would say it's almost reactive mm -hmm. uh, to fears about toppling of governments. Uh, and then proactive in the place like Yemen where a power vacuum creates the opportunity for them to expand their tentacles, to expand their reach prompting a Saudi counter-reaction, uh, uh, leading to sort of uncontrolled hostilities that then grind to a halt. Mm -hmm. uh, have the Iranians, uh, is, is, is Yemen, has Yemen turned out to be in a way a bridge too far for the Iranians? That it's one thing to support an existing regime in Syria or another place, but in, in Yemen that it's that, that proactiveness that now, uh, I guess it's, it's difficult to see the, the war in Yemen is terrible on so many levels. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions about it is, has it, is, it a, is it something that the Iranians are now stuck in because they have made their commitment to the Houthis, or is it something that they could extricate themselves from? Oh, they could. I think, you know, this is a chicken or egg problem. Mm, right. And to be honest, I don't actually know the answer to that question. But think about how much they've been able to get away with within the, within the context of that, of that conflict. True. You know, uh, basically the country is split between North and South, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the Saudis and the Emirati coalition more or less controlling the South, with the, uh, with, with, with the Iranians and the Houthis controlling the North. Uh, and despite, what are we, three years now into this war? Yeah. Uh, the country still remains divided. Uh, the Saudis are going to be unable to reach their political or military goals. Uh, and the Iranians have managed to do all sorts of nasty things in there without really inviting a large-scale response. Think about this. You know, they, have, they have brought in ballistic missiles. They fired those ballistic missiles at Riyadh, the capital city of a, of a sovereign country. And they faced really no international response from that. And they've done it at least eight times in the past, over the past year. So what do, you, what do you attribute the reluctance of the international community to call for a more robust response? It gets back to the original question about the, Trump, about the synergies between left and right, the American politics, and about political constraints, quite reasonably, mm -hmm. placed upon escalation dynamics between, say, Western countries like the United States and a far sort of... Far, it's, Completely, you know, it's by any available metric, Iran is not a powerful country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wealthy, but not all that well run. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are able to sort of control escalation in such a way as that they can achieve outcomes militarily even against um, superior foes. And I guess I am I'm curious about this, right? That the because on the one hand, right, we. The, the criticism of the rhetoric coming from the Trump administration is that they're willing to talk about uh, firmness or whatever word they want to use with Iran. Mm -hmm. But the, the actual range of options available to the United States is relatively narrow um, in the sense, you know, it, assuming that there is a, there's sort of a, a, at least for the moment, there is a barrier placed on the upper limit of any kind of action against Iran. And yet, yeah. is this the kind of thing that, that pressure can build up until the only option available to the United States is a, uh, an escalation that today would seem unwise? I mean, that's always the fear, is that uncontrolled escalation leads to unintended conflict. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and certainly that's always a possibility, but we have to look at sort of historical precedents, recent historical precedents in American decision making, less in Iranian decision making, uh, about how those dynamics would play out. Mm -hmm. you know? And so if you look at, say, Iraq, I, I mean, Iraq is just where it all comes together for the Americans and the Iranians. You know, in the, in the, in the prosecution of the, of, the, of the war against Islamic State, the Americans and the Iranians shared bases. We were on two different sides, and we didn't really interact with each other. They stayed over there, we stayed over here. Uh, but that is a, is, you know, to use sort of the, the parlance of, 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 of nuclear weapons theory, that is a, that is, you know, uh, um, that is, that is a deterrence against escalation of actions on both sides. If you push us too hard in Iraq, we'll hit you back, and vice versa. And so the two sides have sort of fallen into a symbiotic relationship, at least I would say militarily, uh, where the costs of escalation are so great is that we really don't have any options either way. Mm -hmm. Hence why the, 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 the easiest option for any American president, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter, uh, is to use economic sanctions, mm -hmm. the lowest, you know, sort of the lowest common denominator as a way to try and compel, <clears throat> compel changes to Iranian <clears throat> behavior. But for diplomacy to work, the U.S. has to be willing to make concessions too, and that's where I think the difference between the Trump and the Obama administration really comes into play. Because right. where would those concessions be? What would, what, what would the United States offer the Iranians in return for a change in Iranian behavior? You would, so that becomes sort of the, the, the grand bargain that leads to the JCPOA, mm -hmm. is we're willing to give on certain things, uh, so long as you do X, Y, and Z. And in return for X, Y, and Z, you will get sanctions relief and you will get the opportunity to really re-engage with the global business community so that you can try and you know, basically act like a normal country. Do the Iranians have an interest, enough of an interest in engaging with uh, the American economy or with the Western economy that, that it's worth it to them to, uh, to, ramp, to ramp down their other activities in the Middle East? Well, it's been 40 years. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you somebody who lived in Turkey for three years. You know, mm -hmm. Turks look at Iran as, 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 as backwards, uh, religiously backwards, uh, sort of inferior to them. Uh, but they also look at it as 80 million people mm -hmm. with an industry that's not, so they have competitive advantages because the Iranian industry is comparatively far less, far less uh, developed than their own. That's because of Iranian incompetence. Uh, and so you have a lot of Turks at the sort of medium business levels that make silk, that make machine goods, that want to trade with their neighbor. Right. Uh, and they don't want the Americans limiting the ability to transfer money. Well, that leads me to, you know, since you, you've lived in Istanbul, you, you work on, on Turkish policy, right? The, how does President Erdogan imagine Turkey's role in the Middle East? Rising, mm -hmm. you know, is that Turkey has become integral, particularly for the conflicts along its border, to their resolution uh, and independent. Uh, he'll no longer be simply in lockstep behind the U.S. or Europe, but really the U.S., in terms of how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the way the conflicts have gone, particularly in Syria, you know, it's as the conflict has shifted over, over these seven years, for Turkey it's become about, you know, whether you agree with it or not, mm -hmm. what they're concerned about is that as an outcome of the U.S. strategy in Syria, which is heavily dependent on the Syrian Kurds, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that it could leave behind a, 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 a Kurdish statelet that could destabilize Turkey, and in sort of the wildest fantasies, well, that's a, actually not a right word, sort of in the sort of worst case scenario planning of prudent national decision, national security decision makers over there, is that the country could even split. The as country that, could Turkey split. Could Turkey split could split. As a result of split, spillover because of ethnic fissures. Hmm. And therefore, it is in Turkish interest to try and counteract what the U.S. is doing through a mix of rhetoric, military action, and diplomacy. That level of, of defensiveness, I'm curious about you know, the degree to which the Turks are, are, are acting or developing their strategy in uh, response to sort of fears or concerns rather than uh, a, a positive agenda. Because you know, so often Erdogan, it, it is attributed to him that he has a kind of neo-Ottoman belief that the Turks' responsibility is to go in and, you know, quote, restore order mm. in this region. Something that I can't imagine that either Arabs or Persians like to hear. 
No, I mean, nationalism is a powerful rallying factor no matter where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I would say if you had to conceptualize how the Turks think about foreign policy in the Middle East, is they, they, they ultimately ascribe, and that the, the current Turkish national security elite, ascribe the political problems and the instability in the Middle East as sort of a hangover of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. the creation of artificial states in the Middle East, mm -hmm. everything we've all heard, the imposition of artificial isms, nationalism in particular, secularism being the other, uh, French-style secularism. Uh, and third is interventionism, particularly post 9-11 and how the U.S. beginning in 2003 in Iraq, less so in Libya in 2011, but ultimately again in how the U.S. chose to fight Syria post 2011 as well, uh, leads to instability in countries along Turkey's border that they would rather not have. They would rather not have. Uh, before we go on, I have an announcement for the audience, and that is there is a red scion parked in the alley um, next to the museum that is about to be towed. So How if can anybody you read that? The, You're a very talented this, person. <laughs> I, do this, I, do this, I do this for a living. But um, yeah, so these are, these are various global issues that, we, that have to be dealt with. <laughs> but, um, but actually, take a, take a sip of water because I, I want to ask, uh, I want all of you to start to warm up and get ready for, uh, for questions I'm going to turn to the audience in a, in a moment. But I want to ask you one more. Sure. Uh, so, you know, use my, my, my privilege here. And that is, um, I can't decide which one I want to hit you with, but I'm going to go with uh, the relationship between the Trump administration and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Um, that, you know, we've talked about geopolitics, you know, the, the role of Iran, the relative role of Saudi Arabia, that the close relationship between the Trump administration and Saudi Arabia is often personified by the relationship between the crown princes, right? mm. Jared and Mohammed yeah. bin Salman. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's come under heavy scrutiny lately, in part because of the Khashoggi uh, murder um, and the larger question of what exactly the United States uh, what exact, you know, wh when we're talking about the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, are we talking about the relationship between sovereign states pursuing traditional foreign policies, or are we talking about the relationship, a relationship between dynasties who have specific material interests at stake? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I look, I, obviously within state-to-state -state relations, the personalities of individuals matter. They matter. And there are clearly synergies between MBS uh, and Jared, and you know, they use WhatsApp to communicate, which I find slightly, uh, it's really unbelievable, actually. Well, actually, not all <laughs> unbelievable. A lot of US government people talk to people throughout the region WhatsApp. using WhatsApp. It's, it's pretty common. Jeff Bezos uses WhatsApp, too, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I think the way in which the Trump administration has decided to back Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is emblematic of how they pursue, uh, how, they, how they conceptualize American interests, okay. which is purely in reaction to countering Iran. So it's, it's all part of the synergistic rela relationship with the maximum pressure strategy. And so Yemen is a battle space that needs to be won. It's not one where people need to get weak kneed over terrible images in the New York Times. It's one that needs to be settled on terms that are favorable to American allies. Uh, and whether you agree or not, always elections have consequences. This is the foreign policy that they've chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think Jared and the Crown Princes are enablers of what are the instincts of this administration and how to prosecute foreign policy in the, in the region. One quick follow-up, and then we'll be ready. The first question, by the way, will go to someone who has, uh, to someone who has never asked a question at Geopolitics with Canary before. So if you've never done it before, this is going to be your big moment in just a second. But to, but to follow up on that briefly, and that is um, that there was a lot of discussion in, the, in previous months, in the, last, in the last year or two, as MBS has risen and as he's been presented as this reformer, that the United States has an interest in Saudi Arabian political reform. And, and yet the United States also has an interest in Saudi Arabian political stability, mm -hmm. or let's say, or in other words, right, Saudi Arabian political success. Um, when we look at Saudi Arabia right now, what is the connection between the possibilities of reform and the, the, uh, the desire of the regime for stability and or political success in the region? Do they all go together, or do they pull in different directions? Well, I mean, with... 
if you believe sort of the MBS efforts to consolidate this power and what is a, a classical case, uh, you know, to, to put the academic hat on of coup proofing, uh, you know, <laughs> th that I would say caught a lot of people in the United States off guard, particularly because Bin Nayef, you know, was a, a, uh, a, a strong ally in sort of rounding up post 9-11 of Al Qaeda cells and Al Qaeda yeah. networks. Uh, inside of Saudi Arabia and sort of that fu illicit financial money flows out of the Gulf, in this case Saudi Arabia, into at the, you know these 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 contested spaces, Afghanistan, uh, 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 along those lines, for Saudi Arabia. Uh, but you know, as I think should be a sort of hard and fast rule for all analysis of U.S. foreign policy, is we hardly control anything, and if MBS is going to do something. You know, he's going to do it, whether the U.S. says yes or no. Uh, and if you are trying to manage a relationship, you just try and pick up the pieces afterwards. And you say, oh, good job. Uh, but ultimately, I see the MBS reforms, Vision 2030, as just more tools of political oppression. Uh, it may be nice that females could get in a car and drive, but you know, that is a tool to ensure that he has the political legitimacy amongst young people so that he's not kicked out of office. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this has to do, and I'll stop here, is just sort of maybe the counter-revolutionary dynamics that fall out of the, the Arab Spring mm -hmm. and how the region is still just completely flummoxed and imploding from within from the push and pull from illegitimate governance, bad governance, you know, the inability of states to police their own borders, <laughs> uh, civil conflict in Syria, sort of low-level insurgency in, 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 in Iraq, war in Yemen, you know, and, 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 and relatively stable political control in the Gulf monarchies, but on a social contract that we wouldn't say is democratic. It may not be for them, mm -hmm. uh, 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 but nevertheless, you know, a, a style of governance in most places that is predicated on oppression as the means of staying in, 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 in power rather than a social contract where you can be voted out every four years. Mm -hmm. So at that, <laughs> speaking of the inclusion of the people in an otherwise top-down discussion, uh, I open the floor to questions. If you raise your hand, I will call on you, and one of our uh, deeply efficient assistants will be happy to bring you the microphone. So who is my first volunteer with a question? Remember, somebody who hasn't asked a question before. It's a big moment. This is one of the few opportunities people have to shut me up. <laughs> Oh, let's go. This, this, this young lady right here in the front, mm. right? Hi, wait, wait, wait for the microphone oh. make it so that we can get you on, on the online, please. If she can sneak through. Jess, you can make it through? Oh, cool. you can hand that, if you can hand the microphone forward, that'll, that'll do. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Go right ahead. I read that. That's right. I think it is. It is. You just talk right in. I read that uh, Iran is having a lot of economic problems now. Yep. Now, does that mean that there's any chance that those ayatollahs, the religious leaders, could be overthrown? And what difference would that make in the Middle East? It's a good question, you know, and, and this is a raging debate from Washington and I guess Philadelphia about, the, about the, the, the stability or fragility of the Iranian regime. Uh, and I would be circums circumspect of anybody on either end of that pole saying that they're the most stable regime of all time and on the other side being that they're ready to collapse at any moment, they just need a flick. Uh, because most Americans can't go. Uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a PhD, I tried to go. Um, I got in touch with a guy named Jason Rezaian, uh, who ended up in prison and just released a book about his time uh, mm -hmm. uh, in there. Because yeah. he used to you know, sort of help people try and, try and get over there. And so I was, I, it's a weird, weird world. Uh, but there's no doubt that their, their country is run, is economically in, inefficient. The collapse in global energy prices has exacerbated uh, most of their economic inefficiencies uh, and the way that their country is governed. Uh, but they still are slated for GDP growth this year. As much as all the negative news that there is out there, they, they, they manage, they are still slated for growth. Uh, uh, they're, still slated, they're still slated for growth. And my big point of caution always with the people who root for internal topple. And look, I think I want the, the Iranian regime to, to, to mend its ways. I'm in the regime behavior change mm -hmm. uh, camp, just for all Important cards on the table. Is 
the way is what the Iranians thought about the American invasion in 2003, the devil you know. Because you know, sometimes the people who come after those that are toppled are not those that you would hand select uh, to put in place. So this goes back to the idea that we really, we do not control everything. In fact, we, might con we control very little. We control place. very little. Uh, and the, you know, the people who would be in charge of this at the State Department or DOD in analyzing the situation are all very, very smart people. But they would be reactive to events just like us. Just like us. Let's go with uh, somebody from this side of the room, right? This gentleman right here. The microphone will come over to you right here. You can hand it over. Or, there you go. You can hand it down the row there. Thank you. Uh, thank yes, you, sir. Dr. Stein. Um, to what extent do you think, well, first of all, considering how reckless it seems, uh, the, the firing of uh, ballistic missiles uh, on Riyadh mm. uh, by the Iranians, um, even in the context of uh, the Yemeni war, it seems like an awfully reckless action. So the question is, to what extent uh, do you think that represents a significant validation of Israel's concerns? I mean, it certainly does. Um, you know, the, the, the Iranians have in Yemen, uh, but also in Syria uh, and also in northern Iraq, uh, shown <clears throat> more recently a demonstrating willingness, willingness to use ballistic missiles. So not just stockpile them, but to use them as weapons of war. <clears throat> you can, you know, obviously the, the, the attacks on Riyadh are meant to inspire fear. Uh, less is sort of militarily useful. Uh, but the way, in the ways that they were used in Syria is that there was an Islamic State attack uh, against the uh, Iranian parliament. Uh, and in retaliation, they fired, uh, I think, six missiles. Uh, uh, at targets in eastern Syria. Uh, and they use ballistic missiles to target a Kurdish compound uh, in northern Iraq. Now, that's a change to me in terms of how they're using it. And so if you're the Israelis, this is validation of your argument. Uh, this is sort of validation of the, de of the investments you've made with considerable American support in missile defenses. Uh, and the overarching need to ensure that Iran doesn't have the right type of big boom weapons to put on the front of those missiles, like you know, the weapons of mass destruction. Now that's all a validation of the argument, but when you start getting down into policy uh, options for these countries about what to actually do about them, is where I think there's a lot of debate. You know, is it feasible to demand that Iran gets rid of all of its ballistic missiles? Honestly, probably not. UAE has ballistic missiles. Saudi Arabia has ballistic missiles. Israel has ballistic missiles. Turkey has ballistic missiles. I can keep going around the region. Um, but my point is, is, if you try and negotiate a bilateral hard cap on the Iranians, the Iranians are simply going to turn around and say, yeah, we're willing to talk to you, but you have to talk to everybody. And so can you get regional confidence building measures around something? And for me, I always want a hard cap at 2,000 kilometers. Uh, and that's where the French and the Europeans were wanting to get, as part of the JCPOA plus negotiations, uh, after the Trump administration took power. And so they, the, the Europeans said, OK, we hear you, and that we want to get some sort of reciprocal limits on, on this issue that was sort of dealt with in the JCPOA, but not up to anybody's standards. Uh, uh, but those talks have yet to go anywhere. And so the policy sort of tools to try and actually deal with this beyond just sort of the military tools, missile defense, counterforce, all those things, uh, is where it gets interesting and for me analytically fun. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fun? Let's go to, uh, let's go, uh, this gentleman right here. Your microphone is on its way, it's right behind you, sir. There you go. Yes, you talk a lot about the, the, the missiles that Iran has and shot towards, uh, uh, towards uh, uh, Riyadh. But uh, I thought in the, the, that war, one of the biggest issues was the bombing that was going on that the U.S. was supporting. And you haven't mentioned that as, as, as actually, I thought the missiles, in fact, were somewhat of a retaliatory motion uh, on the bombing. Is that not true? The bombing in Yemen. Yeah. Do you <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the Iranians would say that. You know, I think that there's a difference between even imperfect and I would say really unsatisfactory 
efforts amongst the Saudi-led coalition to minimize civilian casualties, albeit on the battlefield versus firing at a, at, at a capital. And I would say that would be a difference uh, that I would draw between the two countries. Uh, you know, but that will be, you know, just to, maybe to blow that point out a little bit, you know, as, as, we, start, as we turn to the, the sillier season, you know, the Democratic primary and the debates about foreign policy such that they take place um, uh, in, in the campaign for 2020, I, you know, the, the, the U.S. participation in the Yemen war as a criticism of Trump foreign policy is something that I'm, I, I think we're going to hear a lot about. And so I think this issue will be one of those things that rises above the fray of the normal back and forth over domestic policy. So I have right here in the front and then, and then this, uh, this uh, lady here. So if you want to bring her microphone to her so she can go next. But first one right here. And then you're next. So if you, go ahead. First of all, good luck in your stewardship of the Middle East program at the FPRI. Thank you. Uh, for a question, uh, at a point in time in the Syrian civil war where it looked at least possible that Assad would be overthrown, mm -hmm. Putin regime announced and then followed up on a very massive incursion and air power. Mm -hmm. And the Obama regime said, well, not to worry, they're simply going to get bogged down in a quagmire. Mm -hmm. Now, looking after three or four years, would you give us your assessment militarily, politically, and economically at how this turned out from the Russian point of view? Yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, and something I spent a lot of time, and uh, my intern slash research assistant Carl's been helping me out with that. We're actually looking at this question right now, you know, uh, is, 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 is the legacy of the Russian air war in Syria. Uh, I think the Obama administration and their framing of the Russian intervention was far too optimistic. Uh, it, over, it overestimated the ability of rebels, opposition, uh, to withstand, you know, significant Russian bombardment uh, 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 um, in support of Syrian ground forces. Militarily, they've sort of stumbled around certain areas, you know, so I would say they're, they're, they're far behind the U.S. in terms of execution and capabilities, but you don't have to be the U.S. in, in order to, to achieve your, your goals. But had they achieved their goals, so have they matched militarily to political outcomes? And I would say after three and a half years of Russian involvement in a war, they're not able to still settle the conflict on their own terms. And so if we were judging it by our own standards, would we call that a success? I'd say we'd call it a wash. Uh, so the story is still to be written. They are clearly in the political driver's seat. They are clearly after the U.S., well, even with the U.S. presence, they're, 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 they're clearly the most dominant in terms of dictating political outcomes. Uh, but getting the multiple-sided multiple players to sign up to their, to, their, to their preferred outcome is still a work in progress. And Geopolitically, if I have to betray my own sort of recommendations for this war, it's always been to quote unquote let the Russians win. Now that seems sort of anathema to great power competition, but it's informed by uh, meetings I used to have with Russians when the U.S. was struggling so badly in Iraq. Is you know they would always say like, oh you know they would you've infringed sovereignty, you're a great imperialist, yada yada yada, and then you know we don't support this, and then we'd have the cocktail reception afterwards, and after two or three glasses of wine, you know they get a little red, and they'd say, God, we love that you're in Iraq because you're spending a trillion dollars a year, and that means you're not spending it on the Eastern Front, <laughs> or the Western Front for them, excuse right. me. Sure. Uh, and so I've always that's always stuck in my mind. Uh, about you know rubles or dollars or finite how they choose to spend them, uh, 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 you can try and channel that spending in ways that are most advantageous to American interests. And for me, trying to rebuild a broken country with a fractured insurgency seems like a pretty good way for them to spend it. If I want them to spend it unwisely. Interesting. So after a few glasses of wine, I would say Russians get red on a variety of levels. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, right over here. What can you tell us about? Um, 
uh, France and Germany and perhaps other EU countries creating a financial instrument. Special purpose vehicle. Special purpose vehicle yeah, to, a, to which would enable their nationals to evade um, U.S. secondary sanctions. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's actually a complicated question. You know, so it was set up in the wake of the reimposition of the sanctions that were lifted after the JCPOA and then reimposed as part of the U.S. pullout or withdrawal. Uh, from the JCPOA, uh, and it it was meant to make the costs of U.S. secondary sanctions uh, greater uh, than they otherwise would be without them. They've stumbled a little bit politically, trying to manage between a, a bunch of countries, and so what you've 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 ended up with on the other end is 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 a vehicle that's meant to facilitate the the, the payments for humanitarian goods. So it's, it's, it's meant to enhance the humanitarian cutout that's already present uh, uh, in US, U.S. sanctions. It is politically very important. You know, I, I mean, I, you're, you, 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 I'd have to look it up, but I believe it's headquartered in France and run by Germans, and then so, or it could be vice versa on that. So the two largest European nations are, are, are taking a stand uh, against the U.S. Now, just today, you know, Brian Hook at the State Department uh, made two announcements. One is that the, the sanctions waivers that were granted to multiple countries, South Korea, India, Turkey, others, all U.S. allies, uh, would no longer be given, meaning that you will no longer get, get a, a sanctions waiver so if you're still importing Iranian energy. And you're only supposed to get those waivers if you're tapering. But the other thing he pointed out was this SPV, this European SPV, is now coming to the, I call it the Eye of Sauron. You know, like the purview of, of Treasury as they begin to look about whether this will comply with U.S. sanctions. So we could be in for a rough ride, you know, where you have sort of the specter of the U.S. Treasury, you know, designating, you know, what is a European-run special purpose financial instrument and the secondary political problems that would come from that. I mean, I can just tell you, like, like the Europeans are flipping mad over the JCPOA. I've never seen them this mad about anything. The JCPOA reintroduction of secondary sanctions and the threat of U.S. sanctions on European country, uh, companies you know, at the political level uh, is really engendered a lot of terrible sort of feelings of betrayal um, and resentment in reignited conversations about how to break away from the uh, U.S. dominant financial system. They'll fail because it's very difficult. This will take multiple, multiple years for them to disentangle. It's probably not even possible. But the point is that they're having these conversations. Yes, sir, right here. What's going to happen to the Kurds? Are they toast? Is Which it Kurds, Syria or Iraq? <laughs> All Kurds. I'll talk about Syria because, uh, well, it depends, right? So the U.S. is now trying to, to do the impossible. You know, the U.S. policymaking process over Syria is in reverse. The president made an announcement, and the bureaucracy is now trying to catch up with the announcement, including the military. Uh, normally, these things would happen the other way, is that the president would ask for guidance on how to draw down from a conflict. It would percolate through the, through the national security apparatus, the American bureaucracy, get to the sort of the, the, the and finally end up at the, at the principal's level in the cabinet, and they would give him three options, and there's a Goldilocks. You draw down, but you do so over the Obama thing, 18 months, and you sort of phase down your trips. You know, that's, that's sort of standard stuff. But Trump didn't consult with his national security bureaucracy, went against guidance, I can promise you that. The guidance that he was supposed to do with, with Erdogan was not to leave Syria, it was to tell Erdogan not to enter Syria. Uh, uh, and so now the bureaucracy is trying to move backwards to catch up with its own president. So as part of this, they're trying to do, again do what should have already been done. Is that how do you try and reach agreement that protects the, the Kurds 
both from Turkish and regime attack, without a U.S. presence. And right now, there's a time-sensitive sta standpoint on this. The negotiations with the Turks are continuing. There was a meeting last week in Washington with the Turks about this. Um, but if you believe open source press reporting, and I do, is that the U.S. right now is sort of will be out of Syria by the end of April. <coughs> Clock's ticking. So are the, the Kurds have options. Uh, well, they're all bad, but there are some least bad and some worse. Uh, they can try and wait out the U.S. and try and convince the U.S. to stay. I think that's pie in the sky, but they can try. Uh, the U.S. can try and broker an agreement with them, but the Turks and Kurds are hostile. Uh, or three, the Kurds can try and cut a regime with Damascus and the Russians that keeps the Turk out, Turks out, but in, that involves some sort of regime return to areas that they, they haven't been in since 2012. Those would get the worst odds in Vegas, meaning that that's probably the, most, the best thing that's going, the, the most likely thing that's going to happen. So are they toast? There are variations of how burned that toast is going to be. It could be lightly burned or really burned, and I think they'll we'll sort of end up with Russians and the regime back in their territories. Let's go, I have one more, one more question um, right here. Uh, this, gentleman, this gentleman here, yeah, go ahead. Just a li little bit um, kind of out there uh, in, in terms of this question. Um, China historically has not played a role in the Middle East, and given what they're doing in Venezuela, do you see them trying to sort of enter the realm of Middle East on a going forward basis? Well, I mean, so we're at this point in sort of like how the energy flows work in that the majority of energy oil pumped from the Middle East now heads to Asia rather than the West. We've, I think we reached that point a couple of years ago. And so by vested economic interests, the Chinese, of course, have, similar to the U.S., uh, you know, an interest in ensuring the free flow of energy out. Now, I mean, I will not claim to be a China expert. Uh, that would be pundit, pundit 101, you know, because uh, I, I don't know much about China and sort of their execution of foreign policy. But in my travels through the Middle East, the Chinese are still not major players. It's... They are there in sort of, sort of infrastructure capacity. Their energy firms are there in sort of secondary roles. They're the subcontractors of some of the major uh, uh, US or European firms, uh, particularly in Iraq. Uh, but they are not anywhere on the level of the American presidents, no matter, American presence. No matter what you hear about retreat, <laughs> whether it's the Obama retreated or the Trump is retreating. Uh, I think the U.S. I think la at last count had 30,000 personnel in the Middle East. That number has been more or less stable. Uh, the U.S. presence is, is robust uh, in, in the Middle East, and there's just no comparison from the Chinese. Uh, there is some interest in the Horn of Africa, Djibouti. Uh, 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 Djibouti is one of those countries that sells its territory as part of foreign policy, so lots of countries have bases in it. Uh, so clearly there's an interest. It's on an energy corridor. Uh, but not quite, I mean, not even close to the level of where the U.S. is militarily, politically. But one would expect, as time goes on, you know, the, the earth keeps spinning, uh, is that that presence will probably uh, uh, continue to grow. So we have about 30 seconds. So I'm just going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a question that is impossibly large, but you can give an impossibly short answer. Sure. Is the Israelis go to the polls? Next month to elect a new government? Oh, yeah. In a month, I guess two months, in April. Yeah. Will these Israeli elections make a difference in jo the Israeli approach to the Middle East? I think all elections matter, but our senior fellow, Josh Krasna, in the Middle East program tells, tells me that BB is set to win, but may be facing some legal problems after he does. All right. You see, now we like to leave, we like to leave you wanting more. So I'm afraid that's all the time we have for tonight. But uh, thanks, Aaron Stein, My for pleasure. sharing your... Uh, your insights with us. <laughs> FPRI, FPRI would like to thank the National Liberty Museum for hosting us tonight and the Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg Family Foundation for their generous support for this program. Tonight's conversation was very lively. It's, un, it's always sad when they have to come to an end, but of course, tonight's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on, and every month we talk about it here on Geopolitics with Granary. If you have enjoyed our discussion today, please... 
tell a friend, and bring a friend next time when we gather to analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of Geopolitics with Granary and other events at FPRI, please visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our various email lists. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. Until next time, for all of us at FPRI, especially the capable staff back there at PWP Video, and my FPRI colleagues in helping to produce this broadcast, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>